This is Making Comics 101, issue 16, Lettering. <laughs> Greetings, people of the internet. I'm Scott with Surfworks Art Labs. Welcome, mad creators, to the underground laboratory where together we are going to make some awesome comics because this is Making Comics 101. This is issue 16. Man, we're getting up there, but it's issue 16. We're talking about lettering today. So there's a number of different ways you can letter, and we'll get into some of the techniques and the tools and all that kind of stuff. But before we get into it, one thing that I really want to express, sometimes people, I don't think they put enough emphasis on lettering. It's just kind of something that, you know, they've done all their artwork, especially independent creators where you're doing the whole thing yourself, and you're maybe not handing it off to a professional letterer. Because lettering is a craft. Just because you're a great artist doesn't mean you're going to be a great letterer. Now, there are people that do both. Um, I don't think lettering is my strong point. That's why as much as I'd like to do more hand lettering, um, I really do appreciate hand lettering. I tend to go digital just because my handwriting is so bad. But basically what I'm getting at is that you got you have to take lettering seriously because a lot of people, they'll do this great artwork and everything, and then they'll go to the lettering stage and they just don't put the, the same kind of effort into it. And Bad lettering can just destroy a comic. It doesn't matter how good your artwork is, if you've got bad lettering, it is just gonna stick out like a sore thumb. So do not skip on the lettering. Take it seriously. Uh, and with that, let's get into talking about some of the uh, tools that uh, you can use for lettering. And we're, we're gonna talk, uh, first off, let's talk about some of the traditional tools. With computers and with you know the modern technology, you see less and less of this, but I think you can t definitely tell a difference. With comic book artwork, sometimes it's gets, it gets to the point with penciling and inking where it's hard to differentiate what is digital and what is created traditionally. With lettering, not so much. You can usually pick out that something is digitally lettered. And, you know, there's some awesome digi digitally lettered work out there. And like I said, the work that I do usually, well, I take that back. The last, the last short comic I did, I did do hand lettering and I had some tricks and things to kind of help me out with those. And we might get into some of those, but um, for the most part, like with my comic book, Young and the Dead, I usually use digital lettering just because I'm not the best, my handwriting's not the best. I mean, I can create nice lettering, but it takes me a lot longer. It's just, it's not natural where I can just script something out and it looks like a professionally lettered comic. So before we get into some of these uh, analog tools, I just want to, I just want to preface that, you know, maybe think about doing more traditional style lettering. And like I said, you have to be skilled at it. Uh, but if you are, I think traditional lettering is just going to look a lot better in a lot, in a lot of cases. All right, so let's talk about lettering tools. All right, so first off, uh, the one thing you're probably gonna need is some sort of a straight edge. I, I you Typically, you can use like a T-square. I don't have a T-square. Um, I use, and I've talked about this tool before, uh, um, I don't know if it was a penciling episode or, or what, but the uh, rolling ruler, the mapping ruler, uh, parallel glider, whatever you wanna call it. It's got a few different names. Uh, but this kind of just move up and down. But what you want to do also, and these are a little harder to find, but you can still find them online, it is this. This is called the Ames Lettering Guide. And if you're familiar with it, you know exactly what it is. If you, if I'm just showing you this for the first time, you're like, what the heck is that? It's, it's a very, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a very unusual tool. But basically what it is, it's got these little holes. It's got a dial here. The dial can move up and around. And it's, it has these little holes in here that you can use. You can put your pencil or whatever in there. And depending on how you set it, you can, you can space the lines across them. Basically then from there, you just take your, your uh, lettering guide with your pencil and you just drop your pencil in one of those holes there and then you run it across here and then you, you can run it across back. Um, but the way it's set up, I don't, it's, I, it's really hard to tell from there because it's transparent and everything. But you'll notice, if you get a better look at this, you'll notice that some of the little holes are really close to each other where there's some that are far apart. So the ones that are close to each other, that's going to be your spacing or what in typography we refer to as letting. So the space between the lines of your letters, the ones that are further spread apart, that's going to be the actual lines of your letters. Now, like I said, you can adjust this to different sizes and everything, um, but this is a pr pretty much the primary tool for traditional lettering. And I don't know, maybe in a quick tip or a bonus episode, I'll show you a little more on this particular tool. We'll find out. So when you're ruling out your comic book using the Ames Lettering Guide, I tend to go with, and I've showed these tools before, 
but the uh, just a regular like drafting tools because comic books and drafting go hand in hand. I remember back when I when I worked in an architectural firm in their design department, we would rule things out just with those lettering guides and everything because at the bottom of each, you know, if you do a blueprint or whatever, you've got some type and some little things there and you want it to all look good and there's there's even a special font that architects use. So anyway, traditional comic book tools, uh, like I said, a lot of them are the same things that you find in, in drafting. I showed these before, but this is a lead holder. Uh, these are the leads. These are non-photo blue. So whether you, you know, these work pretty well because they, they won't pick up on the camera or Nowadays, you can go into Photoshop and you can drop those colors out. Or if you want, you can you can also get these in, in regular like graphite and uh, you can just go ahead and erase those after you've already inked your letters and everything. And I also mentioned there's a special sharpener you need to get for this. And I think there's probably links to these tools in the description of the video. But you do want to make sure that, that your, your lead is super sharp because the holes in the Ames lettering guide are super tiny and otherwise if it's dull, it probably isn't even going to make it through there. Assuming that you're going to pencil your lettering before you actually ink it, uh, some people are good enough where they can just they just go straight to inks if they've got a really nice handwriting or, or just know their type style back and front. If I'm going to be penciling my letters, I want, I want sort of a dull tip, just to make it a little bolder. Uh, so just a tip there, no pun intended. So for inking your letters, there are a lot of different tools you can use. Some of them are just going to be repeats from what we talked about in the inking episode. If I'm doing traditional lettering, I usually just go with uh, like a Micron. You can go with the Micron brand or you can get the Fabric Castile. They're about the, you know, they're about the same. Uh, these pit pens. Some people will actually use like the Hunt 102 Curl Quill. I, you know, <laughs> I still haven't mastered this, especially for lettering. I think uh, <laughs> unless you're just a master at it, I think this is going to give you a lot of trouble and a lot of heartache. But there's some people that can do wonders with this tools, but it is an option. Another tool uh, that I really like is just like either a mapping pen or like a felt tip pen. This is a felt tip pen. And the reason why I like felt tip pens, probably more than a micron even, is that it's it's got, it has a little, you know, it's a little softer tip. So you can, you can press down a little bit more. It's a little smoother to me. So I really do prefer the felt tip pens. And of course, if you're doing analog lettering, unlike digital lettering, you can't just undo. So uh, inevitably you are going to make mistakes. So it always helps to have a, like a white out or a pro white or something that you can make corrections with. So in comics, there's more than just handwriting and typography to think about. We also have to consider our word balloons. So if you're working uh, in, a, in an analog way, then you're going to probably need some of these templates. These are ellipse templates and they come in all different shapes and sizes. You can see some are, are a little closer to being a full circle. Some are a little more narrow. These ones in particular, these are all about the same dimensions, just different sizes, whereas this one gives you a little more variety. But there are so many different kinds of these. If you find your, these are actually pretty big. I don't know if you would ever get to the point where you would need an ellipse that big, but you never know. Maybe if you're doing a sound effect or something like that. But basically with this, you just draw the top and you flip it over and you draw the bottom and then you've got your ellipse there. Those are some of the traditional analog tools. But like I said, most people nowadays do their comic book lettering digitally. The great thing is there are a lot of resources out there. I have my own resources. Just talking about fonts in general, uh, comic book fonts, there are companies that that's all they do is produce comic book fonts. I'm talking about like a comic Comic Craft or Blambot. Those are two great websites that you can go to to get all sorts of comic book fonts, whether it's it's body copy fonts or special effects fonts or any number of different comic book fonts. I also make products for creating comic book digitally. I have the Comic Maker Starter Kit, which is free. You can go to my website at circworks.com and download that. It does come with, uh, I think there's three fonts in there. Also the Comic Maker Toolkit, which is also available for purchase at circworks.com and it has tons of fonts. The good thing is even if you've got both of those products, there is a font in the free version that is not available in the paid version and the paid version has a lot more fonts that aren't available on the free version. So even if you've opted for the pay version, it doesn't hurt to go and get that free version as well. I also have other font packages on my website. I've got one called Jeepers Creepers, which is sort of uh, 
uh, you know, sort of like an eerie, creepy type font collection. It has two different fonts with two different styles for each font. I also have another one called Freezer Burn, which is, there's a hot and a cold style font. So like I said, there's there's tons of products where you go to my site or you go to, you know, Blambot or Comic Craft or whatever, and there are free fonts available, but you just gotta be careful with some of the free fonts. There are some good ones. I think Blambot has tons of, of free uh, comic book fonts that are pretty good. Some of the, the ones that you just get off of Defont or something like that, they're not really that great. Uh, this is sort of cliche at this point, but so I don't know if I need to repeat it, but I'm going to anyway. And that is, do, <laughs> don't use Comic Sans. I, I heard somebody in an interview once saying, saying, well, Comic Sans isn't great. Don't probably don't use it, but it has its place. Like if you're making comics, and I was listening to that interview, and I'm like, no, it's not great for making comics. <laughs> so yes, even for comics, Comic Sans is not good. And there is one. Well, there's actually there's there's a number of good reasons why you shouldn't use Comic Sans, but there's one one really good reason why you shouldn't use Comic Sans, and uh, I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Now, if you're lettering digitally, uh, you can use a number of different programs. Clip Studio Paint is an awesome program because it's relatively inexpensive compared to like the uh, Adobe Suite, and it's it's specifically made for creating comics. Even though I don't use Clip Studio for for lettering, and that's just because I'm kind of set in my ways. I use Illustrator because it is very versatile. It's a vector program. I can you can scale up the type up and down without losing having any loss of quality or anything like that. There's, once you get into more sound effects and things like that, where you're, you're having to change letters, I mean, you're, you're tweaking letters and, you know, adding flourishes and things to that. It just, for me, Illustrator works a lot better as a vector program. There's other vector programs out there. Affinity Designer, I think, is a relatively inexpensive vector program, which I want to look into. But I prefer to do lettering in, in vector because of those reasons. I've seen some people do it in Photoshop. I don't want to say I wouldn't recommend it, but Photoshop is not designed for type. You're going to have some limitations there where in Illustrator it handles type a lot better than Photoshop. But ultimately you just got to use whatever software is available to you, whatever works best for you, and sort of know the limitations of your software just so you can try to avoid any issues down the road. So we've talked about the tools for lettering both digital and traditional. Now let's get into some of the rules. Now I don't really like using I don't really like using the word rules because we we are this is an art form and in some ways art is about self expression so we don't want to attach too many rules so even though I'm saying rules I'm thinking more best practices I always go back to that old adage know the rules so you can break them if you just go off on a whim and you're like I'll do this because it looks cool if you're unaware of the rules you're going to run into some issues so best call them rules call them best practices call them whatever these are some of the the, uh, the rules for comic book lettering. So first off, and this is pretty much self-explanatory, but when you're lettering, just make sure that your work is legible, that people can read it, that it's not hard to read, especially the dialogue. Sometimes you can get a little crazy with some of the sound effects, but you want things to read smoothly. Now, there's a number of different ways. You'll notice in comic books, most lettering is all uppercase. Every once in a while, you will see some lowercase, and there's usually a reason behind that. If maybe if, if it doesn't want to seem as important, maybe there, or if it's soft, somebody who's soft spoken or something, maybe they will use a lowercase font. But typically in comic books, most fonts are pretty much all uppercase. That's just the way it is. And it tends to read pretty well that way where it, that doesn't read as well, like in prose, but in comic books, for whatever reason, it just looks a lot better in all caps. Now, when you flip through comics, a lot of the dialogue typefaces, fonts that you're looking at, they're going to be similar. And that's sort of by design. You're not going to, you're not going to get some crazy. I mean, if you go like on one of the font sites, you're going to see all kinds of different fonts and you may immediately go like, Oh, wow, that's an interesting font. That's kind of cool. It's kind of like a, maybe it's like a bloody looking font or something like that. Uh, and some of those, you know, special effects type fonts aren't going to work well in the, the body of your, of your comic book, the dialogue. So keep the dialogue fairly simple. Sometimes, every once in a while, you know, if you have a different character, like sometimes if you do have a villain, maybe you'll have little scraggly letters or something like that. But I've seen comic books before where they will have, uh, you know, every single character has a different font or even like different colors to their fonts 
and that gets a little too confusing. So I would I would be a little cautious about that. Maybe you've got one character that's kind of got a unique like if it's like a sinister sound, you want a little different font or something like that. But for the most part, when you're creating your dialogue, have have most of that carry on throughout. Also in your dialogue, you also want to keep the point size about the same, meaning the size of your fonts. You don't want some to be larger than others. It just takes away from that reading experience. Uh, you want it all to read smoothly, again, unless you're getting into some of the special effects and or every once in a while you may want to put some emphasis on a particular word and bold that out. But your font should also complement the type of story that you're telling, the style of your story. If your comic book is humorous, you may want to go with a more whimsical font. If, it, if it's more serious, more of a standard font. But just kind of know what your book is and, and decide on a font because that font is usually something you're going to carry out through your entire series. You're not going to want to switch from issue to issue different, a different font for, for the, the body of, of your book. So here's an example from my comic book, Young and the Dead. You can kind of see here that most of the fonts, it's, I'm using the same font, same font size throughout pretty much the entire book. But I do add little, if there's a word, if there's a word here that I want, you know, to punch up, like when people talk, they may put emphasis on a particular word. So just to give a little more insight into how you're supposed to read these, I may bold out certain fonts. I don't know if that's easy to see there. And again, the other thing here, as I talked about before, and I don't know if you can see this right here, but yeah, we're kind of out of focus. But when the, the zombies have an altogether different font, it's, it's more like a kind of chipped away and creepy looking font, uh, whereas everyone else has that same font throughout the whole series. As I mentioned before, I told you not to use Comic Sans for your comic books. So just because everyone uses it, that's one reason probably to, to steer clear of it. Because you you want I mean you want your book to look original. It has such a bad reputation. I you know I can't really get into if it's a well-designed font for what it is. But the one thing that I will say and why you should never use it for comics is because it only has a crossbar eye. So if there is one rule that I want you to take away with, and this will stick out like a sore thumb to anyone who is a professional letterer, and it's something that is so often overlooked. I see it overlooked all the time, even in professional comics. I've been guilty of this before. I actually, in my first issue of Young and the Dead, I, I made this mistake and I had to go back and correct it. So if you're not familiar with what a crossbar eye is, it's pretty much like it, it sounds. Uh, whereas typically you would see an eye with just a straight line, a crossbar has a line across and on top. The only reason you should ever use a crossbar eye is like when you're saying I, like having to do with you. Uh, so for instance, I'll show you some instances here. You know, I'll be back. I'm out of here. I've altered the deal. I was victorious. So in these kind of cases, now here is one instances and you can kind of see why you don't want to use this. So whereas this, you know, definitely use the crossbar I here. Just as a rule, it doesn't look good just to have this with just I. It's not as much of an affront as this is here, whereas you have these crossbar eyes in the middle of a word where it says victorious. Um, you don't want to do that. You want to have you want it to have it look like it does here. So only use the crossbar I when you're saying I, I'm, I've, I'll, and never in the middle of a uh, word. And that is why you don't want to use Comic Sans. One of the main reasons you don't want to use Comic Sans because it doesn't have this eye here it only has this eye so stick away stay away from comic sans or any font that doesn't it, that only has those crossbar eyes so there's some other lettering rules that i want to bring to your attention that may go overlooked and that is if you are lettering and in your copy you have numbers you want to spell those numbers out you don't want to just put the numerical number like you would see on a calculator and again there's exceptions to every rule maybe if it's like a countdown like if it's like if you have something that's like five four three two one maybe in that case you can put that numerical number but typically what you want to do if you're saying oh he's 25 years old you don't want to write 25 in there you want to spell that out um, another thing, uh, ampersands. You don't want to use ampersands in the place of an and. When this becomes an issue, I think, is when people are trying to fit their fonts inside that word balloon and maybe they don't have enough room. So it's like, oh, I've got three letters. I can't really put three, but I'll just, I can do an ampersand instead of writing and out. But really the only time you should use an ampersand is when you're dealing with like, uh, you know, a brand name uh, that has actually the ampersand in it. Like, uh, you know, M&Ms or uh, A&W or AT&T, something like that. Just a, a rule uh, having to do with ampersands that most people don't even think about. So those are some rules. Uh, there, you know, there's 
probably plenty more rules. A lot of it just comes down to aesthetics, what looks good, but those are some of the ones that I see over and over again that you may just want to watch out for. And you got to learn this. I mean, you, you have to have an eye for lettering. Like I was talking about earlier, you could have this great, you could be a great artist and not really understand lettering. I remember I had a friend that came to me and he created this comic book and it was, I think it was his first comic, but he was just a brilliant illustrator and it just looked amazing. Uh, but he was doing his own lettering and it wasn't even like a comic style font. I think he was just using regular, like, uh, you know, like a sans serif, you know, font, like, like a Helvetica or something like that. Uh, and it just, you know, it just did not look right. So, you know, just understand lettering and it really all, all it takes is look at some professional comic books, do a little research, just pay attention. And the more you read, the more you look at it, the more you'll understand, oh, I see this looks good. That's kind of how I learned for the most part. Later on, I got tips from professional letters. Oh, oh don't do that. Or, you know, you probably should do it this way. But for the most part, it was just me looking at, at fonts and looking at the word balloons. And sometimes that's hard because even professionals, sometimes you'll see some that, at least I'll see some that I don't really, I'm not, don't really care for the way uh, the lettering or the balloons are laid out or anything. Speaking of balloons, let's talk a little bit about word balloons. So yeah, word balloons. Uh, with comic book lettering, there are basically two kinds of containers that you use to put your letters in. One is the caption box, which typically is more done for narration, and it can be just a, like a rectangle or square or whatever, and you can add some effects to that too as well. You can make it like a scroll effect, or there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do to those. But that's basically like a narrator telling the story or giving a little insight. Uh, for anyone that's speaking, the dialogue, that is all done in word balloons. Sometimes people call them speech bubbles, whatever you want to refer to it as. I, I say word balloons. One of the biggest issues that I see when people are, are putting their uh, dialogue into the word balloons is they're just not giving you're not giving that dialogue enough room to breathe. Sometimes your word balloon will be butted up right next to the font and it's just, it's very constricting. So you want to get, I mean, you don't want it to be too big, although that is an effect. Like there are, and there have been times where I've had the, uh, like a wide balloon with maybe just one word in there. It, it's just a stylistic choice. Like somebody has something big to say, but they don't really know what to say. So they just say one thing. That might be a reason to do that. There's all different reasons and you can play around with that. So yeah, you just want to make sure that you have plenty of room to breathe breathe in your word balloons. Everything's not just jam packed in there and everything. It makes it a lot more legible and just pleasant to look at. And in the bonus episode, I'm going to go in depth a little more and show you some of this stuff. I know right now it's just basically me talking to put this information out there, but we'll dive a little deeper and I'll show you some actual examples of how this works so you can see it for yourself. Now, if you've seen any comic, then you've probably seen a word balloon and you'll know that the word balloon consists of that, the balloon or the bubble. And then it's got what is a balloon tail, that little thing that goes through, and that's going to kind of trail down. And basically what that is, is just to indicate who it's coming from. If you just had a bunch of, you know, balloons here and there, you're not going to know who's saying what. So you want to make sure that that comes down and is pointing to your character, particularly his mouth. You don't want, you don't want your balloon tail to kind of curve down and point to the, your character's stomach or, uh, you know, or his hand or something like that. Uh, it should go fairly much close to the mouth. I mean, you don't want it to go like actually over the character where it's like actually coming out of his mouth, but like right about here, you know, somewhere in there. So just make sure that you know where those are going and everything. The other thing you want to pay attention to is that if you've got a couple characters in the same scene, so you've got a character here on the left, but he's not the first one speaking, so his balloon's going to be over here on the right and vice versa. And then you've got these balloons that kind of cross. It gets confusing. It's almost like like Ghostbusters where you don't cross the streams. You don't want to do that with your balloon tails either. So just plan that out a little bit. You may want to kind of switch up the orientation of your characters uh, depending on when they're speaking, if you can do that. That's all in the planning stages and that, that's some of the things that you get better at. And going back to what I was saying before, you just gotta, you know, read some comics, look and see how people are doing it. And that's, like I said, that's kind of how I learned for the most part um, to avoid some of these, these mistakes. Now, not all word balloons are created equal. There are different varieties of word balloons and you have to know when the right time to use each one of these. So I'm just gonna show you a little chart here. Here are some of the different kinds of word balloons. Um, hopefully you can see this. So we've got a speech balloon, which is pretty much your basic balloon. That's gonna be for dialogues. It's the most common word balloons used in most situations that speech balloon, uh, the thought balloon, which doesn't get used as much anymore. A lot of people will not use this in favor of a caption box. 
I'm a big fan of the thought balloons, so I still use them, uh, but you're finding it less and less nowadays. So the thought balloon is when a character's thinking to themselves, they're not saying something out loud, and that is just where it's almost like a little cloud. Instead of that balloon tail, you've got these little dots here instead. This is a burst, so this is gonna show excitement or sound effects, so you see there's a number of different ways to pull this off, but it's basically looked like you know, something blowing up or something like that. So you can see that here. Um, in this tail, I've actually made almost like a lightning bolt. So you can do stuff like that. A whisper, this is just a, a dotted line. And, and a lot of times in this, these are all the same, like I was talking about before, these are all the same uh, type size. Um, but maybe if somebody's whispering, I may even have the body copy of that. They may be one instance where I vary from the norm and I make that copy a little smaller just to show that they're soft spoken or something or if they're whispering but just a dotted line for somebody speaking quietly or in secret uh, a radio balloon and there's a number of different ways you can illustrate this this is just an example but this is something that's coming from electronic device like a radio or, or something like that and then an effect balloon and right here I've got sort of like a freezing effect and these can be almost anything this is just a balloon that's going to reflect what the dialogue is or what the person's saying. You can have one that's more like fire and everything. I even some of my my fonts, the ones that are uh, the font packages like the freezer burn, I actually include word balloons in that font pack and there's, you know, so I've got some balloons that kind of have the flames coming up and kind of the freezing depending on which one you're using. But there's a number of different ways you can do, uh, the effect fonts can be almost anything, but basically the idea is that it's reflecting what is being said, the emotion that's in that balloon. Uh, and these ones you probably want to use sparingly as well. For the most part, you want to stick to this, uh, the standard, you know, speech balloon. But every once in a while, if you want to, you know, you want to put some emphasis on a particular character or something that you're saying, you can go with something like this, but sparingly. As I mentioned, lettering is something that's often overlooked, but we don't want to overlook it. We, we want to learn to be better letters. We want to learn to understand lettering. Even if we're handing off our work to a professional letters, it doesn't hurt for us to know a little bit about it. And really, it just comes down to practice. Like I said, my handwriting's not the best, but on the other hand, I create fonts and I just have to spend a little more time with it. I can't just write it out real simply, but I'm always practicing. I mean, I've, you know, I just take like line notebooks. Now, this is in the, one of those situations where there is a a lowercase font. Uh, most of the fonts that I create, most of the fonts, like I said, in comic books aren't uh, lowercase. Uh, here's some examples here. But I'm constantly, you know, I'm constantly just practicing my letters, you know, just like you were a kid in school. But with this, you're, you're looking for more style and, you know, you want that sort of fun, handwritten look. And uh, yeah, just, you know, practice with fonts, look at comics, study comics and you're gonna you're gonna start to see uh, the correct way to do lettering and like I said I will get more into some of the actual technical aspects and show you some examples creating fonts or balloons and how that stuff fits in on a bonus episode so yeah that's pretty much gonna do it for this issue of making comics 101 and I will see you guys later that is all Hey, thanks for watching. If you like what you saw and you want to see more, hit that subscribe button. Also, you can follow me at Surfworks on social media, and now you can support the work that I do on Patreon. Do you like making comics? Then go to surfworks.com and pick up the Comic Maker Starter Kit. It's packed full of fonts, brushes, templates, and more. And best of all, it's totally free.